Now, I'd like to welcome uh, the, the respected analyst, publisher, and researcher with an executive leadership experience, Mr. Lauren Moss, who will, who will talk about his own experience and who, who wants to share his, uh, his insights that he learned from Uzbekistan. So um, I knew that uh, our, our colleagues, <coughs> there, we, there we go. I knew that they were going to uh, talk about the statistics and things like that and the quantitative things. So I thought I'm not going to go back into, okay, the unemployment rate or these kind of numbers and things like that. But let me talk more about my experiences, my first time visiting Tashkent. And, and one of the things that, as for those of us who, most of us in this room who work in the field and we travel a lot, um, I see friends like John and Paige, um, and we're constantly uh, in a plane somewhere. And when you, when you talk about a place that you haven't been or you're looking at a place for the first time for business, you go, what's it like? You want to know about the statistics and tax rate and all that stuff like that. But you also want a qualitative feel for what it's like because we've seen deals lost just because places there are places where people just don't want to go. The numbers are right, but people either, either um, for other different qualitative reasons, uh, maybe don't, uh, don't find it attractive. So briefly, my background, for those of you, probably most of you don't know me, um, I've worked as a consultant uh, to businesses for location strategy, um, usually early stage. A lot of times site selectors work on, and I've done this in the past too, where they're, okay, let's talk about the tax incentives and see what the utility rate is and things like that. Usually I work earlier stage, so you look at, let's consider, let's make a short list of places, and let's look at what places are even suitable uh, for us to do business, and then we can narrow it down and see if somebody's going to give us a great deal, like obviously um, with IT Park. 0% uh, tax rate. So when you get to that part, the job for site selectors becomes easy. Um, authored several books uh, uh, and edited several books. Uh, I've worked in international commerce. I, I've worked independently as a consultant now for about uh, a decade before that. I did work in the commercial real estate side uh, at an independent brokerage. I was with uh, Joe Slang and Sal uh, for a bit as well before going out on my own. Um, but um, so if, I, if we talk about Uzbekistan, I, you know, when they, they, they contacted me uh, for the first time a year ago, and I wasn't able to make it because of a scheduling conflict, and then they came back uh, this year and said, hey, can you come? And I said, great. And, and the question that I would ask is, what did you know, like if I think about what I knew before I got the call? And so a lot of times, and, and I tell our friends that a lot of times countries might have a negative perception to overcome. Um, in Uzbekistan, the good thing and the bad thing, like, like the Honorable Minister mentioned, is that sometimes there's just no perception, right? And, and in a way, that's an advantage, because it's easier to create, because it gives you the opportunity to create the perception and to start from scratch and to create your reputation rather than, than kind of overcoming a bad one. I, I currently live in, uh, I'm from Ohio, but I currently live in, in Colombia, and a lot of times I had, we had a company from, um, from Ukraine, this was back before the current uh, troubles, this was back in 2016, and they were coming to do business in South America. And the, and the poor guy, the first time he shows up, he's staying in an international hotel, and I went to get him for lunch, and he was afraid to come out the hotel because he watched too much Netflix and thought it was 1990 or something like that, okay? So I said, come on, you're gonna be fine. Um, and so he ended up loving it and things like that. But there, I've seen the challenge when you have a negative perception to overcome, but Uzbekistan doesn't suffer for that. They, they, have, they have no perception at all, and that's what we're trying to change. And the advantage is that now we can create a positive perception. So I would ask, you know, you guys, before you got the call from us, for those of you, I see a lot of people in the room that already are familiar with Uzbekistan, but I would say, what did you think about um, 
uh, you know, when you first thought about Uzbekistan. Uh, and uh, so that picture actually is in their, their metro system. They have a lovely uh, subway system. It's absolutely spotless. There was an earthquake in the 60s, and, the, and they actually, at the time it was part of the Soviet Union, but they actually took the opportunity to create from scratch a subway and it's completely modern. Uh, it's spotless, as you can see, um, lovely. You can get a kind of a glimpse of the, of the, uh, the public life there. Um, so uh, a lot of people, this is a, a view. I took these, these photos, by the way, so if they're blurry or anything like that, it's my fault. But these are pictures I took when I was over there. This is actually a nighttime view uh, of kind of a family-oriented park uh, that, that you can see. And um, you know, a lot of people, I did the same thing. A lot of people, when they go, I'm going to get invited to Uzbekistan, or I've heard about Uzbekistan, or they're having this event, and they go and they look on YouTube, uh, and find, you know, travelers videos where they'll go and read old news articles. And I'll tell you, a lot of those are, are outdated because um, there was a big change in Uzbekistan in 2016. Everybody from the United States, we think, okay, you know, Soviet Union days and after Soviet Union days. But Uzbekistan actually went through a major, major change um, in kind of government structure and attitude and things like that in 2016. And I remember you guys probably saw some of the same videos I saw where they were saying, oh, you know, it's a nice country, but the streets are dirty, things like that. It's spotless. You know, I went over there, there and, and this is, these changes are in the past less than 10 years. So uh, a lot of information is outdated, and uh, they've been going through an amazing transformation. You know, a lot of us have worked in developing countries. I currently live in one, and I've never seen a country modernized so quickly as Uzbekistan. It's really amazing, and you have to see it on the ground for, for yourself. And so, on one hand, there's the modernization, and there are the changes that the country's going through. On the other hand, the country has an amazing history going back. I, I, I would recommend any of you that go and attend the event next month or in the future that you go over there, take a couple days. It's, it's the ninth safest country in the world. Take some time and go and see the amazing uh, sites that the country has. So Uzbekistan was a key component in the historical Silk Road. Um, you know, the country, the, the, the idea of a, of a nation state is kind of a modern one since the, the 1600s Uzbekistan history. The history goes way back. They look at uh, Timur as kind of their, the founder of the, of the, the nation, if, if you will. Um, you'll find in European textbooks, they call him Timurling. Um, that was because they don't like him, but that's an interesting story. But um, Timur was the uh, was a, a, a conqueror. He kind of was in the time right after the, the, the Genghis, he came after the Genghis Khan period. Um, and uh, the ethnic and linguistic similar, similarity is, is, is very similar to, to Turkish. Um, I think the, the modern Turkish people kind of migrated there from Central Asia, and so there's, there are ethnic similarities, the language is similarities. I think that most people who can speak the, the Uzbek language can read or understand Turkish, kind of similar to like Spanish and Portuguese uh, or something like that. Um, it's a secular state, uh, it's a modern state. Um, now, it, it, it's a multi-ethnic state, and it's really interesting because during the Soviet period, uh, Stalin moved a lot of people around, and so there were ethnic Korean people from over by Vladivostok and by the, the eastern part of the Soviet Union, and Stalin made a lot of them move to Uzbekistan, and after the Soviet Union thought, it's just a nice place, we're already here, you know, let's, let's stay here. And so you have, actually, people don't realize this, but in, in, in Central Asia you have a multi-ethnic uh, culture. A lot of people that were ethnically Russians that were moved down there 50 or 60 years ago are still there. And so you go there and you think it's going to be one thing and it's actually very, very different. It's really, it's really impressive. Um, it's, a, it's a secular Muslim country, so um, uh, there are a lot of old, um, you know, this was amazing. This is in Tashkent. It's actually one of the, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a complex there. It's, it's kind of like, if you think about Turkey, you know, Turkey is a predominantly Muslim state, but it's also a secular state. You know, you'll see people, you'll see women in shorts and things like that. So it's not anything like, like if you think about people say, oh, it's, it's Uzbekistan. They go, is it Pakistan? Is it, is it Afghanistan? No, it's nothing like that at all. It's a very modern, secular, you know, um, we went up, Paige and I were over there and said, hey, let's go get a beer. No problem, was, you know, you can go get a beer. You know, so I know John will worry about that, so. <laughs> um, 
Uh, you know, it's, it's secular, it's, it's, uh, there are, it's a democracy. Um, I was there during elections. Um, there, now the current president is very popular. Um, he's genuinely popular because he's modernizing the country. Um, the, you know, right after the Soviet Union, if it wasn't so, and so a lot of the older materials that you might read, um, make sure, check the dates on it, because make sure that, because a lot, of, a lot has changed. Um, this was like right before, a few days before the election, and these are different presidential candidates, and those are their platforms, and this was kind of out in the public, and so, you know, they weren't being repressed. They had TV ads and ads on the subways and things like that. The current president won because he's very popular, but, you know, you're able to go out there and speak your mind, and so that's important to point out as well. Um, so, um, uh, if you look the, the, the as, as um, Sultan mentioned, um, the country is very, uh, is oriented now towards the West. Um, it's looking to modernize. There's a uh, history of bilateral co cooperation with the U.S. Um, as um, the minister mentioned, there's a delegation meeting in Washington this week. There are some new uh, announcements that I've been following in the news. In the country, the ties are growing closer. When I was over there, I met with the, uh, the U.S. Um, ambassador. Uh, in Tashkent, and uh, the demographics are very young. You see people in senior le leadership like like Aziz Beck and like Sultan Murad, you know, who, uh, somebody made a comment once, and, and you guys don't know this, and they said, I said, no, those guys are like the senior managers, and they said, really, those young guys? I said, yeah, and the thing is great because not only are they capable, but the country has a, a young population, highly educated, and also highly motivated. These guys are highly motivated to modernize their country. You see, you know, I got goosebumps to see the spirit of people working together. Really, they're really serious about what they're doing, and it's really impressive the progress that they're making. So, uh, I just took this picture out on the street. You can see they were advertising, um, and this is like why I like to go and see things myself and not just get the brochure. What do I see when I walk around? And I'm, I was on my way to get some plov, which is the national dish, by the way, which is delicious, and you've got to eat a lot of it. Uh, when you go. Um, but I was on my way to the Plop restaurant and I saw uh, this slide and you can see here they're teaching math or, you know, SAT, you know, uh, math, and, math and English. So prep, prepping for the SAT, like like people will maybe go and study in the U.S. or something like that. The English test, else um, speaking club, general English, things like that. And you can see um, the, the signs are in Latin alphabet, the signs are in English, and the signs are actually uh, there in Cyrillic, uh, so, so Russian. Um, as well. Now, one of the things I think that's really cool, um, when I say that the country's westward looking, all these cars, like three of those, all of them except for three or four of those cars are American, mostly General Motors. Okay, you know, it's really amazing. You go there and, you know, a lot of countries you see all the cars are like Japanese or Korean. In, in Uzbekistan, all the cars are American. Like, almost all the cars are American. If you see, like, anything, there, there are other cars, but but um, uh, the American cars, I think almost all of those cars are Chevrolet, actually. Um, and I thought that that was cool. I actually counted them, and and well over 90%. So you talk about the, the, those trade ties have been there for a while, and they mature uh, and developing. There's a plethora of hard-to-get languages. Uh, English is already the third language. It's becoming the second language. Um, I mentioned the young workforce, and um, Sultan Murad mentioned the the, uh, the the inexpensive wages. But uh, but Uzbekistan also has its own language that's close to Turkish, and so you can get. If you talk about um, you know there's IT, but if you talk about B two B P O and like contact center support and things like that, you can get Russian language, you can get Turkish, you can get um, a lot of the, the the languages from the surrounding countries uh, as well. Um, Korean. Um, German, English is already the number three language. Once the country gained independence from the Soviet Union, uh, it actually switched its alphabet, which, you know, the Soviet Union mandated that it was Cyrillic, uh, and they actually quickly switched it to the Latin alphabet that they used before, uh, up until um, the, uh, eight, the 19th, 20th century, actually. Um, so, so that kind of gives you an idea of, of the, the linguistic flexibility, but then also the attitudes. As soon as they could, they wanted to switch back. Um, let's see, and that, that sign, by the way, is in the bazaar. There's a famous bazaar that goes back uh, hundreds and thousands of years, and, and, and the food of the food is amazing. I gained like five pounds when I was there. But I mean, here's a sign, you can see the sign is in, 
It's in the Uzbek language, it's in English, it's in, um, it's in uh, Russian. And that's not a tourist destination, that's just kind of a place that's there, uh, you know, naturally like that. Um, so what, what would, you know, people go again, you go to places, I've seen deals where the numbers are favorable, but I've seen, I've seen site selection deals come apart uh, or, or, or long-term investments not work out because uh, you had a place that the executives just didn't want to go. You know, and uh, I'll tell you, Uzbekistan is not like that. You go over, you go to Uzbekistan. It's a family-friendly place. There's a lot of places that we, when we work in outsourcing, we go to some places sometimes, and it's not necessarily, you know, the place that you want to spend a lot of time away from home. Uzbekistan is not like that. It's a socially tolerant place. You're not going to have uh, really any culture shock to go over there uh, at all. Um, uh, it's modern. It's very clean. Uh, Infrastructure is good. It's very safe. I walked around and went out and did things like that. I didn't really need a translator. Um, uh, you know, there's there's still as we, uh, professionals largely speak English. Um, you might, if you go off to a small town, you know, still have a little bit of difficulty, but not a lot. Um, family friendly. This was an event uh, that they put on for us. Um, it was amazing. Uh, she is one of the the like national treasure singers of. Uh, Uzbekistan, you can see it's, uh, you know, we, you know the, the DJ came out afterwards and everybody's dancing and things like that. Uh, they, they treated us amazing when we were there. But it's the kind of place that if you have a long-term engagement there, you're going to want, not only can you bring your families, you're going to want to bring your families. Okay, there's so much, the tourism, you know, go down to Samarkand and there's so many different sites to see and just that, you know, everything is both, is fun, but every trip is going to be a history lesson. Uh, as well. And so um, the last thing I want to talk about is impact sourcing. Uh, and this is something that's more and more important. And that's to say that when we go and look at where we're going to do business, we want to make sure that we're having a positive impact. And if you look at the numbers, for example, if you look at, if you remember um, in Sultan's uh, presentation, uh, the wages were very low. And that's an advantage uh, for um, when we look at where we want to put a place for, for labor costs and things like that, but also what's happening is the country's rapidly developing. And so when you go and site a location or operation in a place like Uzbekistan, you're going to have a tremendous positive impact because they are investing in putting the education in there and putting the human talent infrastructure in there, but then you're also going to be uh, aiding and having a positive impact in the development of the country. The country is going from an agricultural um, and resource-based economy to uh, a services and modern economy. The economy uh, was based in the past on mining. Uzbekistan was also famous for cotton. Um, and now the, the government, uh, the president, the minister, um, IT part, uh, is working hard to modernize the economy and to bring the country uh, and to make it, not just bring it into the 21st century, but make it a leader. Um, and so I think that our investment um, and you can assure your clients, if you're an outsourcing firm, uh, for example, or your stockholders, that you're having a positive impact when you come in here uh, because you're helping not only um, a lot of young people that are eager to advance, but also even if you think diplomatically, you know, if people say, okay, what can we do? I mean, I'm an American, so I think about uh, in this global uh, um, kind of, I, I don't know, a scenario, how can we strengthen our friendships, you know, the, 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 the Uzbek delegation is in Washington this week, and what can we do to strengthen our friendships with places like this? And I think that when we do business, when we, when we strengthen these commercial ties, then uh, there's a lot to say because you have people now that are working for companies and interacting with us on the phone every day. I saw a truck broker firm that was um, uh, operating, and they were taking support calls from U.S. truckers that maybe if the truck broke down on the side of the road and things like that. And so those interactions, wow, this guy just helped me out. And one of the things I always like to do when I'm on a, on a support call with somebody, like if, like for Amazon or something like that, at the end of the call, I'll say, where are you from? And they kind of get nervous and they think I'm going to complain. I'm just, I'm just curious, you know, and I'm like, you did a good job, and I just wanted to know. Um, and so I think that, that, that there's so many different levels, uh, but, um, but uh, impact sourcing is, is really critical. Uh, as well, and we're able to make a big difference uh, for our companies, for our shareholders, uh, for the Uzbek people, but then also for uh, just patriotically. I mean, just, just helping, doing our part to strengthen those bonds and strengthen those ties 
uh, and those human connections. And I think that that's a great opportunity that we have. And so those are my thoughts. You know, I, I'm sticking around. I'm not going anywhere. So if you have any questions, I don't want to get us off uh, off the agenda. But you know, feel free to during the coffee break come up to me, and I'll share my opinions with you. Um, and I'm really excited. I mean, I really was impressed when I was over there. Uh, it's an amazing place. It's an amazing. Uh, people, whenever I go back, like say if I'm back for a three days meeting, I'm going to stay at least a week if I can because there's so much to see and I want to go through the country uh, the next time I'm over there and go and visit the villages and, and, and other cities and things like that. So uh, I was impressed. I'm sure if you go over there, you'll be impressed too. So thanks. Thank you so much.